From South Carolina Public Radio, this is the South Carolina Lead. I'm your host, Gavin Jackson, and this episode was recorded on May 1st, 2023, from South Carolina Public Radio studios here in Columbia. Just so you know, some of the information in this podcast may have changed by the time you've heard it. One thing that's not going to change is our live taping this Saturday. That's right, it's our second live taping of the year, and it's taking place Saturday, May 6th, here at South Carolina ETV as part of South Carolina Public Radio's 50th anniversary open house. The open house starts at 5 p.m. and goes to 7 p.m., at which point we'll kick off our live taping event. RSVP is not necessary, but it is encouraged. We're going to have a lot of swag. There's going to be a lot going on. And two of your favorite friends of the pod, Meg Kennard and Jeffrey Collins, will be with us on set talking about the State House and SC 2024. You can find out more at SouthCarolinaPublicRadio.org. Now let's take a look at our episode, which features comments from Senator Tim Scott about his expected presidential campaign launch. Crystal Spain becomes the first black woman to lead the state Democratic Party and does so ahead of the 2024 First in the Nation presidential primary. The House and the Senate remain very fluid heading into the last two weeks slash six legislative days left until Sunny die on May 11th. Victoria Hansen has a report on the ramifications of legislative actions on transgender youth in the state, and we have economic data for you, a Boeing update, and more. The lead loves hearing from everybody. That's why we have a voicemail box set up at 803-563-7169. Give us a shout. Tell us what's going on in your life. It's going to be May. It's here. May may the 1st through the 31st be with you. (laughs) Let us know what you got going on. Spring is springing. School's winding down. People are graduating. The leaves are green. (laughs) They're still on the trees. Guys, please, I need something to talk about. 803-563-7169. South Carolina Senator Tim Scott is running for president, and he'll make his formal announcement on May 22nd in North Charleston. Here's how the junior senator phrased it before some 150 supporters on Sunday in Charleston. I believe this so thoroughly that it is time to take the Faith in America tour, not just on the road, not just to an exploratory committee, but on May the 22nd. In North Charleston, South Carolina, it is time to make the final step. Please tell your friends, be in attendance. North Charleston, more details coming your way. We will have a major announcement and you're going to want to be there. Scott held a town hall event with hand-picked supporters at a charter school in Charleston on Sunday. It was clear the purpose of the event was primarily to get video for upcoming ads and likely his launch video as well. With a production crew of at least eight cameras and disclaimers posted on doorways, it was obvious. But Scott still took several friendly softball questions from the crowd, which included several elected officials, from a few low country mayors to state house members. Scott is the only black Republican senator in Washington, a combination that he says has Democrats terrified. I honestly think that the the liberal left and the the, the Biden team fears an African-American conservative Republican about as much as they fear anything else. I thought it was just because I was bald, but that's not the case. I thought it was funny too. Thank you very much. Here's, Here's the truth. My life disproves their lies. People tell our kids today that if you're a white kid, you're an oppressor. And if you're a black kid, you're oppressed. That's a lie. We live in the fairest, freest land on God's green earth. We have made so much progress that we don't even have time to celebrate it. But there are those forces who want us to question the very look of a man. That's a, that's a 1920s approach. But the goal is not simply to silence minority conservatives. The actual goal is to use race as a weapon, weaponize race to keep the control and the power over the people. That's the goal. They will use whatever tool they have in the toolbox 
to make sure that they maintain control. And if we're afraid of each other, they control. Scott, who is 57, would join fellow South Carolinian Nikki Haley in the current GOP presidential field, which also includes former President Donald Trump and millionaire entrepreneur Vivek Ramaswamy. Scott didn't break any new ground with any of his responses on Sunday, other than to give a firm date on when he'll be taking his next step. Also, the week of May 22nd, the U.S. Senate is off, which would make for a perfect time to swing through New Hampshire and Iowa after his announcement on Monday of that week. We'll be on the road with the senator, whatever happens. On Saturday, Crystal Spain became the first black woman to lead the state Democratic Party as chairwoman. With 686 votes in the first round, Spain secured just over half of the some 1,300 South Carolina Democratic delegates from all 46 counties that filled up the Goodman Building at the state fairgrounds. Spain, who had the backing of Kingmaker Congressman Jim Clyburn, as well as other key endorsements, such as Democratic National Committee Chairman Jamie Harrison, all helped her best the Democratic Party's Black Caucus Chair, Brandon Upson, in the first round. 30 votes went to activist Catherine Fleming Bruce, who also helped Spain reach that margin on the first ballot. Spain said despite the split among Democrats over the race, she's ready to unite the party and move forward and lead the first in the nation Democratic presidential primary on February 3rd, 2024. Um, it means everything. When I came to this party, I came to volunteer. I didn't even know that this was an office, right? Like I was a blank slate. But I now know from all the experience, all the volunteering, all the jobs that I've held, the importance of who's in this role, who is setting the stage, who is implementing the strategy so that we can win. 100%, I'm a unifier. I ran a race that was above board. I talked about who I was and what I'm going to do. And I look forward to working with my opponents. I look forward to working with the people who didn't vote for me. Like I said in my acceptance speech, I am happy that they, that they participated in the process. And that's where we get our votes, when, people, when everybody's invited to participate. With Spain's election, she becomes the fourth black woman to lead a Democratic Party in an early voting state, joining Georgia, Michigan, and Nevada. Spain has been involved in the state party for years and was the party's executive director from 2016 to 2017. Spain is a political operative and has also served as the state director for Senator Bernie Sanders' 2016 campaign and Senator Cory Booker's in 2020. She also led voter outreach efforts in the 2022 midterms with several major wins that helped limit the losses in the U.S. House, giving President Biden the best midterm election for a first-term president in years. Spain is looking to grow the party, which hasn't won a statewide office since 2006, and has been steadily losing statehouse seats over the years. Bringing in resources and leveraging my experience and my relationships to get those resources, bring them to bear, so that I can implement a winning strategy, a 46-county strategy that prioritizes rural counties, right? So that we can recruit strong candidates state for statewide offices and that we can mobilize our voters with year-round voter engagement. That's what it's going to take and we can do that and we're going to do that. The convention itself took hours, replete with party business, from amendments on how to vote for four leadership races, including the coveted first vice chairman position. Colleen Condon, a lawyer who has served on Charleston County Council from 2005 to 2016, has also led the Charleston Democratic Party and been an active Democrat for decades. They became the first non-binary person to win the first vice chair position. After three rounds of balloting, the race came down to them and former chairman Trav Robertson. Condon said on Twitter, quote, This vigorous election shows our readiness for the first in the nation primary. We need everyone's passion and ideas to accomplish our full potential, quote. Next up, we kick off the second to last week of the General Assembly. The House has several meetings this week, but I don't see any subcommittee hearings for S-374, That's the Senate-approved six-week abortion ban bill that is the last hope for Republicans if they want to restrict abortion care access at all this year, since a House bill just failed again in the Senate last week. This six-week ban is nearly identical to the one that House lawmakers previously passed in 2021 and that the governor signed into law. It worked its way through federal court before being thrown out after the fall of Roe last June. It was briefly implemented and then blocked by the state Supreme Court, which ruled it unconstitutional in January. Since last August, South Carolina's 20-week law has been in effect. The House will take up the Certificate of Need bill debate this week. The CON repeal bill, S-164, centers around the regulation of medical facilities like hospitals and standalone surgery centers in the state. Doctors and Republicans say the current Certificate of Need situation is anti-competitive and favors powerful hospital systems, which, along with DHEC, have approval power over, say, a group of doctors forming their own surgery center. Republicans say that states that have repealed this regulation have seen lower costs and greater competition in the medical industry. A Senate Finance Subcommittee will take up the House ESG bill 
H3690, which would require the state's retirement system, investment, and management decisions to exclude factors that are collateral to or not reasonably likely to affect or impact the financial risk and return of the investment, such as the promotion, furtherance, or achievement of environmental, social, governance, or political goals, or objectives, or outcomes. So that's a long version of what ESG is. Recent legislative sessions in Colombia have focused heavily on transgender issues, but we don't often look beyond the headline or bill description to fully understand some of the complex issues in a day and age where some demonize those who even mention the phrase gender identity. South Carolina Public Radio's Victoria Hansen has this look at how one family is dealing with the ramifications of the legislature's recent actions. Mike Merrill thought he'd grown numb to the sting of discrimination as a gay man who married a rabbi and fought to adopt children. The Jewish part or the gay part, that's who we have always been. So we're used to it. But when you come after my kid, (laughs) then I get mad, yeah. Merrill is angry. Some state lawmakers have been pushing a ban on gender-affirming health care for transgender minors, like his 15-year-old. Emily was born a boy, but feels like a girl, and has lived quietly that way until now. It's kind of hard coming out to my friends because I don't know if they'll accept me or not, but I'm pretty sure they will. Emily decided to come out in part to appear before lawmakers last month, who advanced a bill banning the gender-affirming care she gets. Here's her other dad, Charleston rabbi Greg Cantor. Some of these laws seem like they could be dangerous for people like us who are just trying to raise her family and keep them healthy and safe. But keeping kids safe is what lawmakers like Republican Senator Josh Kimbrell say they're trying to do by banning hormone therapy puberty blockers, and surgery for transgender minors. And I believe that age of 18 needs to be, there needs to be a boundary to protect these children uh, from, frankly, whims that they may not be able to reverse later. Emily says her desire to live as a girl is not a whim, but who she is. Her family consulted doctors who prescribed puberty blockers, which are considered the standard of care by major medical associations. For years, Emily saw physicians at the Medical University of South Carolina. But when she recently went back for a follow-up, her family was stunned. MUSC no longer provides gender-affirming care because lawmakers passed a budget proviso threatening state funding. Left without a doctor and expiring treatment, her family called endocrinologists across the state. Nobody returned my call. Nobody returned my call. And I, I think that they're scared. Then they learned Planned Parenthood South Atlantic does provide gender-affirming care with parental consent, as well as referrals at its Columbia and Charleston clinics. Natalie Frazier is the program director. And, you know, I see on a daily basis how life-changing and life-saving gender-affirming care can be for young people who, who are needed. Studies show transgender people experience much higher suicide rates and the flood of anti-LGBTQ legislation in Republican-led states is crushing their mental health, even as it's challenged as discriminatory in federal courts. The bills in South Carolina not only ban gender-affirming care for minors, but force schools to out transgender students to parents and make it nearly impossible to change birth certificates. It is intolerable to me to live in a place that so clearly doesn't want me. That's 18-year-old Eli Bundy, who's transgender and moving out of state for college after fighting these bills for two years. The idea that people would like impulsively seek care, I think is ridiculous as someone who has actually sought that care, because even when everything is working in my favor, It still took a long time. Eli's father, David Bundy, is a pediatrician who believes medical decisions for children are best left to doctors, parents, and patients. He points to the American Medical Association, which calls gender-affirming care necessary for transgender people. And he says the issue goes beyond a small percentage of the population. Because the issue is not about transgender people. The issue is about does the legislature decide what the medical standard of care is in the state of South Carolina. Transgender rights activists are hopeful the bills here will go nowhere as the legislative session quickly winds to an end. But they worry next year is an election year. 
You can find that report and more at SouthCarolinaPublicRadio.org. Next up in economic news, the U.S. Department of Commerce reported economic growth slowed in the first three months of the year. Data. First quarter gross domestic product came in at an annualized rate of 1.1 percent. That was down significantly from the 2.6 percent in the fourth quarter. Data. But while the first quarter growth was down, it was still in positive territory compared to the 1.6 percent contraction from January through March 2022. Commerce said, quote, that the increase in real GDP reflected increases in consumer spending, exports, federal government spending, state and local government spending, and non-residential fixed investment that were partly offset by decreases in private inventory investment and residential fixed investment. Imports, which are a subtraction in the calculation of GDP, also increased. Translation, you are being good little consumers out there. Two-thirds of our economy is fueled by the people like you and me buying and shopping and buying and shopping and buying and shopping. I understand. <laughs> so a good time to pitch Scott Morgan's indebted series right there. <laughs> Take a listen to that on SouthCarolinaPublicRadio.org. But this slowdown also comes as the Federal Reserve continues to combat high inflation through higher interest rates, all of which pinches our spending ability. Now, there's data. The Consumer Price Index is running at 5% right now. And the Federal Open Market Committee meets this week with the expectation of raising interest rates another 0.25% at a time when the fallout from turmoil in the banking sector is still reverberating and could show the economy on its own. The Fed policy rate right now is around 4.75 to 5%. While CPI is at 5%, the Fed's preferred inflation gauge eased in March. The Personal Consumption Expenditures Price Index rose 4.2% for the 12 months that ended in March which is down from 5.1% in February. Again, look out for a likely 0.25% interest rate increase by the Fed on May 3rd as the central bank looks to fight inflation. We'll also see April jobs numbers come out this Friday as well. And we got some Boeing news for you. Speaking of quarterly reports, we got a quick earnings report from the aerospace giant that reported a first quarter loss of $425 million on $17.9 billion in revenue. Revenue has been increasing and the company expects to reach upwards of $5 billion in cash flow this year as more planes like the 737 MAX and the 787 Dreamliner are ordered and delivered, though delays and defects have plagued both manufacturing lines. But several big orders were notched from January through March, including Air India ordering 20 Boeing 787s and Riyadh Air, the newly formed airline in Saudi Arabia, ordered up to 121 787s. Brian West, chief financial officer at Boeing, said this on the quarterly call last week. We had 11 deliveries in the first quarter and still expect 70 to 80 deliveries this year. We're producing at three per month and still plan to reach five per month by year end. We ended the quarter with 95 airplanes in inventory, most of which will be delivered by the end of 2024. We booked 379 of abnormal costs in the quarter in line with expectations, and there's no change to the total estimate of $2.8 billion. We still expect abnormal to be largely done by the end of this year. The overall goal is to reach 10 aircraft per month by 2025 or 2026, according to executives. Boeing delivered 11 787s of the first quarter and is working through its inventory to deliver some 80 planes by the end of the year. And since we're throwing on millions and billions with a B, Let's quickly jump to Washington for a moment. Senator Lindsey Graham's office has announced that he has requested more than $460 million worth of funding for a variety of South Carolina projects. The 64 projects range from $101 million for Fort Jackson's reception barracks and $50.6 million for Charleston Harbor deepening reimbursement to other projects, including a combined $61.8 million in federal funding for drinking water and wastewater improvement projects for places like Terrell, Rock Hill, Aiken, Casey, Columbia, Florence, Pickens, and Chester, just to name a few. A combined $4.2 million would go to help law enforcement officials across South Carolina and support projects that include new vehicles and equipment, information sharing, and upgrade 911 technology. Again, that's $460 million in requests to the Appropriation Committee for their consideration in the fiscal year 2024 budget. Graham is one of the top members of the Budget Committee, which drafts budget plans for Congress and also monitors and enforces rules surrounding spending, revenue, and the federal budget. That is different from the Appropriations Committee, which crafts spending plans. And on the way out, if you're one of 780,000 Dominion Energy customers in the state, your electric bill will be going up. Residential customers will see a 3.91% increase, 
whereas commercial and industrial customers will see an increase of 4.63% and 7.11% respectively, following the approval of the Public Services Commission meeting last week. Welcome to the wind down section, our little break from the news, and we're glad you're here. Mm. Right, A.T. Shire? Oh, I'm so glad you're here. This is just a little break from the news, though. Just a little. We just, you just break off a it's little bit. It's very hard to escape it. It's uh, omnipresent. Yes, it uh, controls haunts, my it, life. Yeah, it haunts both Gavin and I's uh, waking and sleeping nightmares. We both have waking nightmares from it. Uh, well, I sleep with my eyes open, so I'm constantly yes, awake. Yes, you never and Gandalf are very much the same. I, wanna, I often say that. I want to know people's news consumption habits. <laughs> Give us a call and talk about that. If you guys need a prompt, tell me how you consume the news. You know, obviously come, the lead. Yeah. Come just rate, like, rate you how know, sick you are. Do, you know? do, you, do, do normal people get tweets pushed to their phone? Like, do they get breaking <laughs> news alerts? Like, what's it like to be normal and not care about the news? 803-563-7169. Anyway, Gavin, I, I, honestly, our pleas from last week, they have been heeded. Please. Okay? The hopper? Mm. There's some stuff in it right now, <laughs> but that doesn't mean don't call, okay? We a lot still, of in the trunk. We still, there's a lot of junk in this thing. Uh, we do want you to still call, but anyway, <clears throat> Gavin, uh, this person that called here, they're going to use some technology for us, okay? So are you uh, ready? Yeah, Okay, cool. here, here we go. Hey, this is uh, Nate Labrador calling in from uh, northern Greenville County, somewhere out in the sticks. And uh, so you're talking about uh, robots and AI and all that kind of stuff. And I figured I'd head over to chat GPT to ask him to write an evaluation of the podcast. And uh, uh, here, here it is. I'll read it for you. Oh, the South Carolina lead podcast? It's a real tour de force, let me tell you. The way they blend hard-hitting news coverage with insightful commentary is truly impressive. And don't get me started on their use of swords and guitars to convey complex policy issues. It's like watching a masterclass in multimedia storytelling. I mean, who needs well-researched analysis and expert opinions when you can just lash your way through the news with a trusty blade and forget about nuanced discussion of policy? Why bother when you can just strum a few chords on a Les Paul and call it a day? Honestly, if you're looking for a podcast that values style over substance and gimmicks over actual journalism, then the South Carolina lead is definitely the one for you. Just be sure to bring your own sword and guitar. You never know when you might need to join the fun. Anyways, uh, I'm not sure what chat TPT has, uh, uh, where they got all their information from, but it's quite quite funny. Anyways, thought I'd send that your way. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Nate, for that. Um, <laughs> ChatGPT really still has a long way to go there. That was really a mad lib. This, yeah, Absolute mad lib. The sword talk really got into ChatGPT's brain. Only talked about swords two times, and yet ChatGPT is like... through it. Oh, we cut through the news, okay? <laughs> I, I, I love we, that. We don't even talk about the news, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we've ever written about swords or anything. Like, does it listen to us? But thank you for the call, Nate, by the way. And I yeah. love the project that you did. For I want to, I was actively trying to get back on ChatGPT to get a review as well. Mm -hmm. So then I want to see what ChatGPT wants to say to my face. Yeah. So I said, please critique the South Carolina Lead podcast. It says this news podcast covers current events. Da -da. Overall, the South Carolina podcast is well produced. Thank Look you. At that. Thank you. And that's for me. with high quality audio. Look at that. Uh, that's me too. And engaging hosts. Oh, okay. Oh, that's you. The podcast covers a wide range of topics, including politics, education, healthcare, provides in depth analysis, interviews with experts and newsmakers. So, a little contrary to Nate's chat GPT. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, and this, this gives it a response like, you know, in an interview, it's like, what's your biggest weakness? Well, I guess I just don't have I, a weakness. I just, I care too I much. I try too hard. I care too much. This is the chat GPT saying that basically. One potential critique is that it might be too focused on South Carolina. Oh, that's a shame. And politics and government. <laughs> that's a shame. <laughs> Which could limit its appeal to a broader audience. Mm -hmm. We know our people. We're here we for love South our people. Carolina, South Carolina. You're the best people out there. Okay. Only the best. Uh, only the best listen. Uh, the greatest minds. <laughs> <laughs> uh, some the other critique is can sometimes be overly focused on uh, swords. Yeah, issues. Swords. No sword talk. In no, this it one. doesn't even mention the swords. But I love. I mean, that. It can, maybe Nate's ChatGPT is. 
I just like that that it's the more spun up the most popular AI in the world right now that we know of. They know that I get paid for guitar lessons <laughs> in Lord of the Rings Swords. Uh, and we also want to just go ahead and announce that this is our last non AI produced podcast. <laughs> yes. AT, Gavin and Gavin I us. Gavin and I have been loading his voice into <laughs> the computer for years now, and we think it has a full profile. It's basically his brain digitalized. So it's gonna be Type to, to spoken word. Exactly right. And uh, it's going to sound seamless. It's, it's gonna not, be beautiful. You guys won't even be able to tell. <laughs> I mean, you could you could try and fool it, but all the wind down, it's, it's going to be AI too. Have you been seeing this? Like a lot of voice performers are like terrified that their livelihoods are going to be gone now. I saw that Drake <laughs> sued someone who posted uh, like his, someone rapping his song or something like when that. When they, when you give your rights away as like a performer or something like that, like there's just so much nuance in there and like mm-hmm. these companies pretty much own your voice. So it's... It's very difficult to see where it goes. But there are AI models out there where people are like, give them the text to read, and then mm-hmm. you have a voiceover from someone. Instead of spending like $1,200 on someone, you're spending 20 bucks on a chat. Which is nuts to me. So it's kind of terrifying to think about like, you know, when, when it's coming for the creative industry, mm-hmm. that's when I'm like, oh, how much farther can we go? I say, <laughs> let's go full bore. I want to be a Wally person. You can't person. replicate this kind of- I want to be a Wally person. <laughs> yeah. That's my dream. Don't okay? you guys want to keep podcasting? Uh, well, we kind of want to be like those Wally guys. We're really into the Wally people. And I'm uh, back on my Diet Coke. Gavin's Just on back. the campaign trail, folks. Back no calories on, on the campaign trail. It doesn't count. Free. They stay on the trail, okay? It stays on the trail. Everyone knows that. Ask Mike Gennard. She will I agree. I had a good ham sandwich at Spinx yesterday. In, I uh, hate in that sentence. I hate that sentence that you just said. And I got I got to end the podcast on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm bringing up food here. I'm bringing up food. I got to put my foot down and say we're ending it on Gavin saying he <laughs> eats great sandwiches sandwich? at Spinx. Okay? Spinx is a better gas station food provider than your regular rep. Typical sure. grab and go. That's fine. But I also had I got my mayonnaise, got my Duke's mayo, got Ugh. some mustard. So put that on there. Mayo's fat. Otherwise, it would just been a dry sandwich, which I still would have done. Disg- of course, you would have. Yeah, I'm, that's how I live. Uh, you're, One you're, mile at a time. I I, I I worry for you. I'm scared for you. I saw him eat four pieces of pizza just before we recorded that's this. That's part of my process. Yes, he is pizza in, news out. Everyone says that. But anyway, Gavin, <laughs> say goodbye. Please come to our live show. Come to the live taping, folks. It's on May 6th this Saturday. We're going to be hanging out. You get to see us face to face and say, hmm, not what I expected. I, I expected better. Oh, I also want to say thank you to all the friends of the pod that I saw this weekend. The Democratic Party convention. A lot of folks came up and said hi uh, to the folks that I miss. Uh, come see us on Saturday. And again, thank you for listening to the pod. Show us your appreciation like Nate did by giving us a voicemail at 803-563-7169 or review on Apple Podcasts. We love those. You can stay up to date with the latest news on SCETV.org and SouthCarolinaPublicRadio.org. And don't forget to support your local newspapers. For the South Carolina lead, I'm Gavin Jackson. Be well, South Carolina. No, you can say, I'm Michael Caine, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> by the way. By the way. By the way. <laughs>